Great Escape is the last Six Flags park I needed to visit in America. Its size and location didn't make it a major destination for me. But in 2021, I decided to make the trip to upstate New York and check it out. Coaster fans give this park very little attention, and so does the Six Flags chain. But I thought it was worth checking out, and it happened to be the place where I hit a very big coaster milestone. So let's dive in. These are my honest opinions of The Great Escape, based on my experience on Monday, July 19th, 2021. First off, where is The Great Escape? It's all the way up in Queensbury, New York, pretty far off to the east, but nowhere near the top. It's about an hour north of Albany and two hours northwest of Six Flags New England. So that's your best bet to hit this park up before or after Lapping Wicked Cyclone. If you have any crazy ideas that this is close to Darien Lake, it's not. It's a five hour drive. We came to The Great Escape from Knobles, and that's about a four and a half hour drive. We got preferred parking, which is right across the street from the park. We walked over a bridge and were greeted with the park's old arrow looper, Steam and Demon. We got through the entrance and went directly for our Go Fast Passes. This is the Flash Pass system that Six Flags uses for their lower tier parks for some reason. One thing that was nice about these Skip the Line tickets is that you didn't have to pick your ride up front. They just give you the tickets and you can use them wherever you want. I was sitting on 498 coasters going into this day, and this isn't a great park to find a good coaster to make number 500, but I did have one in mind. Let's talk about those coasters. I made my first coaster of the day and number 499, Canyon Blaster. This is the park's newest big coaster, and when I say new, I don't really mean new. Every coaster I rode here was relocated. This Aero Mine Train came to the park in 2003, after spending 25 years at Opryland USA in Nashville, another four years at Old Indiana Fun and Water Park, where it doesn't look like it was actually constructed, and then it ended up at the Great Escape for the 2003 season. I had this weird idea that this was going to be a typical mine train with a long train layout, but that was dumb. This was relocated. It's going to be short, and it's going to fit on any plot of land it can be slapped onto. Canyon Blaster had a pretty big line with those slow dispatches in one train, so we used our Go Fast Pass. This is one of those rides where you have to enter through the exit so you end up stealing someone's seat, and I absolutely hate that. But we didn't want to wait an hour for this, so we had to do it. This ride is pretty tame. It's got two lift hills, but it doesn't do much with the layout until the end. That final helix starts off slow, but then you pick up some serious speed and it gets wild by the end of it. I guess that's the one redeeming factor of an otherwise forgettable ride. So now I'm sitting on 499 and I'm ready for number 500. I don't think you'll find a single person who wouldn't say that Comet is the park's best coaster. This came to the park in 1994, but of course that's not where the ride got started. It started off at Crystal Beach in Ontario, Canada, and it was there from 1948 to 1989. That park shut down and Great Escape snatched it up. This is not a small wooden coaster you can just pick up and move. This thing is over 4,000 feet long and almost 100 feet tall. This was going to be a worthy 500. You have to walk all the way to the back of the park to find the Comet, all the way behind the water park. And thanks to this obscure location, it was basically a walk-on. It was also running two trains, which was great. Something I did not expect for a Monday at a park like this. I got the back row and I saw that it had PTC lap bars. Definitely not my favorite, and I think buzz bars would be perfect for a ride like this. But we dispatched and went through the double out and back layout. My summary of the Comet is basically very long, very smooth, zero airtime. It's a double out and back woody, so there's a lot of hills, but it just pulls no negative Gs. I was very impressed with the way the coaster was maintained. It's old and relocated, and it runs great compared to other rides in the chain that aren't as old and were never moved around. And those things jackhammer your teeth out. Great American Scream Machine, I'm looking your way. I also rode this in the front car to see if there was any airtime up there, but there was nothing. I still think this was the best ride in the park. A very long and enjoyable coaster, but based on the fact that people seem to rave about this, I thought it would be a little more forceful. We were walking around the back of the park, and before you cross the bridge, you run into Alpine Bobsled. I was told this would be closed for the day, and it wasn't open when we got there, so I had no expectations of riding this. This came to the park in 1998, after spending 11 years between Six Flags Great Adventure and Great America. While we were passing by, we saw it testing. I figured, at the very least, I could get some testing footage, and just hang around with the off chance that it may open. They ran a ton of test runs, and suddenly, we see people inside the queue. We rushed in there just in time. That line absolutely exploded behind us, so being close when it opened saved us a ton of time. I've ridden La Vibora a bunch of times in the past, and this has a similar ride experience. The big difference is the trains. Vibora's got those three-person single-file sleds, and Alpine Bobsled has you sitting two across with four rows, with actual seats. This makes for much better capacity. Looking at the off-ride footage, it looks pretty tame. That's not how it feels. Without a track, in a heavy car with eight people, this thing is all over the place. There was one point where the car felt like it jumped the track, and that made everyone in the train go nuts. Just like Vibora, Alpine Bobsled is pure chaos. 
And the way it rolls into those brake runs and kind of straightens out is super violent and kind of painful. I could do without that. But at the end, I thought this thing was really fun. And it's a shame that a really unique coaster like this is rarely open. Being able to ride the Alpine bobsled was one of the biggest surprises of my entire road trip. The last credit of the day was Steam and Demon, the aero loop screw that's been in the park since 1984. It started its life in New Orleans back in 1978 at a park called Ponch and Train Beach. But that closed in 1983 and Great Escape swooped in and took advantage. First, I love the setting. It's right there on the hillside as the first thing you see when you walk toward the park. And although these old, small aero loopers don't ride all that great, they are really photogenic. I rode a coaster just like this at Wild Waves called Wild Thing. And this was basically that. I didn't love it or hate it. It didn't provide much of a thrill and it didn't beat me up, so it was fine. This is right across from Canyon Blaster. And it's right next to the park's newest thrill ride, Adirondack Outlaw. And both of those had a long line. You'd think Steam and Demon would get some of the spillover from those two rides. But that wasn't the case. This was a walk-on. So those are the four coasters that I rode, but they do have two others. I was told the Vacoma Boomerang, flashback, would be closed, and it was. I imagine this was due to staffing. This is their one major coaster that was not relocated, built in 1997, located near the front of the park. If I had to pick one coaster to be closed here, aside from the kitty one, I'm glad it was flashback. It's a boomerang. How great can it be? The other coaster was Frankie's Mind Train, their actual newest coaster, built fresh for Great Escape back in 2005. It's a Zamperla Gravity Coaster, and I found I was too tall to ride it without a child, so I couldn't pick up that credit. And no, I'm not going to try to borrow a kid to do it. Let's talk about the park itself, starting with the layout. Most parks are a circle, or an oval, or a long and skinny, but this one seemed like it was shaped like a star. This makes backtracking necessary once you're done with one of the offshoots, and that's not convenient at all. But that being said, I never felt like I was getting lost at the park. Compare this to Knobles, which seems simple, but I'm always getting lost there. One of those offshoots goes back to Flashback, their Larson Loop, and their Drop Tower, Sasquatch. Another one goes up the hill to Canyon Blaster, Adirondack Outlaw, and Steam and Demon. Another one goes into Timbertown, where all the kids' rides are. And another one takes you back to Alpine Bobsled, Comet, and the Water Park. There may have been other parts of this park I never even saw. Sometimes it's hard to tell when you're there for the first time. Almost all of their food places were closed. The only one we saw was open was the chicken place. They had some snack places open, but this was the only place to get real food. It seems like this park was hit hard by staffing problems, more so than just about any other park that I went to this year. After my visit, I heard they were going to start closing on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, so there's even more proof. While we're talking about food, I did appreciate their freestyle machines. Those can kind of be hit or miss at Six Flags parks, and I would not recommend using mobile ordering. We tried it with the Funnel Cake place. This was the only place on the app that was set up for it, and the employees didn't even know how to use it. They had some pretty weak merch inside the park, and to our surprise, the main gift shop was outside the park. That's weird, I've never seen this before. Silver Dollar City has something kind of similar, but you're never really outside the gates until you leave the store. This one is legit outside the exit. So in the end, Great Escape is a nice park to visit, but I doubt I'll be back there for a very long time. It's nice that Six Flags gave them Adirondack Outlaw, which is a major thrill ride, albeit one with low capacity, and because of that, I had to skip it. It would have taken over an hour to get on. We couldn't use our Go Fast Passes on it, and we just didn't have that much time. They just do not get new coasters here. And the last one that was even relocated was 18 years ago, so who knows when they'll get anything again. If you're in the Northeast, especially if you're a Six Flags member, I would recommend you check it out. Comet is worth a ride, and if you're lucky enough to ride Alpine Bobsled, that's even more reason to go. If you have to decide whether to go here or revisit one of the bigger parks in the Northeast, I'd probably recommend revisiting a park like Six Flags New England or Great Adventure or Hershey Park. But if you're trying to get to all the Six Flags parks in America, like I was, you gotta hit it up just to get the experience. If you've been to The Great Escape, let me know what you thought of it in the comments below. Is this the worst Six Flags park? Or is there another one out there that's below it? What did you think of the operations or the park as a whole? There's more to do here than just the park. There's a lodge next door, along with an indoor water park, which I obviously didn't have time for, nor is something that I'd be interested in. But if you're into this or have kids, it could add a lot to your Great Escape experience. So regardless what you did at the park or the resort, sound off in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to drop a like. That's the best way to show your support for the channel. And if you're new here and love coasters, be sure to sub and check out my playlist for more park reviews. Also, check out my links below for my Discord server, where you can chat with other fans of the channel, and my second channel, where I post copyright-free off-ride footage. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.